Hello, everyone. Welcome along to yet another episode of the Luton Town Supporters Trust podcast. You'll know if you're a regular listener by now, I'm your host, Kev. And with me, I've got regular guests, the Lutonian journalist, James Cunliffe, and town fan Dan Barrett-Davis for the Brentford Review episode of the podcast. Can you believe it? We are yes! I love this town. I love this town. I love this town. This, this town. You know what I love about this town is actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're Luton people, and that's what we care about. Gents, how are you doing? Uh, a bit of a silly question after Saturday, I guess. I'm warm. It's a downside more than what <laughs> I was on Saturday, that is for sure. Uh, we will go through the game then. Uh, Brentford 3, Luton Town 1. Mm. Probably won't take too long to go through the game, to be fair. There wasn't an awful lot in it. And we'll cover a few talking points that have come out at the end of it. So before we um, go right into the 90 minutes, James, team news, team sheet, no Alfie Doughty. Um no Andros Townsend, uh, Tahith Chong uh, and Issa Kabore came in. We we expected Issa Kabore to come in uh, in the preview podcast and he did. How were you with that team sheet? A little bit surprised by the Townsend admission or is that just literally three games in a week and you've got to manage him wisely? Yeah, it could be that, but you'd have thought that Brentford would be the game you want to get him on there to try and affect a result, wouldn't you? I mean... Yeah, the next two games are um, looking incredibly daunting. <laughs> um, Don't know what you're on about. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Only, only Arsenal or Man City, isn't small, it? <laughs> small matter. Um, so yeah, that was that was. Uh, you know, I've talked about Tith Chong maybe getting his chance because he's been really performing quite well. Um, so I wasn't too fussed there, but uh, obviously the doughty one is uh, as a blow because he's such an outlet and his uh, crosses are uh, so accurate. Uh, so that w- that is a worry considering the amount of injuries that are floating about all seem to be in defence as well. Well, actually, midfield suffering as well. Yeah, we're probably going to use that word injuries quite a bit uh, over the course of this podcast. Um mm. Dan, how are you with the team? I mean, obviously the big omission was still no marvellous Nakamba mm. in the heart of the side. And for the second time running, we really felt it. Yeah, I mean, you can't underestimate what, what Nakamba gives you in midfield. You know, he does a lot of, a lot of the donkey work, as we've said a lot on, on here before. Um, so you're always going to miss that. And because of how um, brilliantly he does it, he's so effective with how, how he plays as well. So when... When he is missing, you know, we, we've got people that can come in and do a job, but not quite as effective as what he does, because that, that is what Marvellous is all about. And yeah, I think we really missed it. We do miss him when he's not playing. You could argue we didn't miss him as much against Palace, but he's still a big player. Still a big player for us, and you, you miss people like that when they're out. Yep, yeah, you absolutely do. And um, yeah, we did we did miss him. There's There's no doubt about that. So on to the game then. For the second week running, an absolute nonsense of a first half. Really, absolutely nothing happened in the first half at all. The longer it went on, to be fair, Brentford probably pinned us back more, but that was only because we couldn't barely be back in, um, any further anyway. You know, it was just... That was the concern for me, James, to be honest. We mentioned it in the preview podcast. We don't mind being deep and offering little threat at Aston Villa and at Old Trafford, but if you're not going to possess a bit more of a threat away to Brentford I guess the question is when are you going to offer that little bit of a threat and to be fair to Brentford uh, sorry to, to be fair to the players that were on the pitch we couldn't get Barkley in the game they obviously knew he was the main man there's absolutely no way in this world Chia Ben is anywhere close to fit there was a few times that he had the fullback with half the pitch in behind him you think back to the Liverpool game when he was fully fit and he squared Alexander-Arnold up and he shot straight past him. This time it was always stop, rolled a ball inside. He's clearly nowhere near fit. Tahith Chong just couldn't get in the game whatsoever. Pelly couldn't get in the game. Really, Barkley was a one-man in a three-man midfield and 
once Brentford realised that, they just kept on forcing Luton further and further and further back, not creating anything of any note. I don't think Kaminsky's made too many saves in the first half. Certainly nothing that was memorable like at Crystal Palace, but it's just worrying that I think you had to wait until an hour into the game for Luton's first touch in the Brentford box. That is not good. At Old Trafford, at Villa Park, okay, they're good sides. You've got to worry about them. At the GTEC Community Stadium, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I think it's a valid criticism of, of the performance. I, I expected more. I know in the preview podcast I predicted a one all, but I did expect a bit more going forward and attacking impetus. But at the same time, not that surprised that it's a keep keep it tight scenario in the first half when, I mean, even match of the day have caught on to the fact now that Luton has scored so many goals in, in, towards the end of the game and that seems to be where they're trying to do the damage but um, well, it's, I suppose it's just not great to watch is it the, but you know we were going to we, we knew we were going to come up against these sorts of things in this division um, and I, I just saw I just saw that Brentford and their current form you could you could have got at them a bit more but you know, if, if doubt is not even playing and Ogbeni, um is, is, can only just about get on the pitch and he's not really in full flight, then that really does stifle a lot of what they're going to be doing in, the, in sort of in a, in a counter-attacking sense. I mean, Danny, the, the thing about us as an attacking side on Saturday was the right back that was named uh, Christopher Ayer pulled up in the warm-up. So the fellow who was playing right wing back, sorry for them, not right back, came in, you know, relatively cold 15, 20 minutes before kickoff or whatever. Not once did we go at him. The other side was a right footer playing left back because their left back Rico Henry's injured. Not once did we go at him. And it's kind of, yes, we're keeping it tight and that's fine. But if you don't offer an outlet the other way, they're just going to come further and further and further and further at you. And before you know it, you've got 11 on the goal line and something's going to go in. And mm. as it turned out, credit to the boys, because that didn't happen. We got through to half time nil, nil, mm. but with the away games to come, surely that positive intent has got to be a, a lot stronger. Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I think if we give Brantford the credit, they, they should, they deserve they. You know they've, they've been a Premier League side. I think it's their fourth season now, and they 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 are a very established Premier League side. And the G Tech Stadium is always going to be a difficult place to go, as we found out. And we've we've always known with Griffin Park that it was always tough because I don't really recall too much happening there where we've come out with anything positive. Um, so we've always known Brentford are going to be a tough opposition. But as regards with uh, fullbacks and that, yeah, it is it is a bit frustrating that we don't attack as much because we've. As, as as we all know, Luton historically go at people. You know, we we do go at people, and I think they're trying to manage it in a way that we're not going to get rolled over. I mean, I remember being at Villa Park and just thinking, well, if we'd started that game and gone at them, would have been hammered, absolutely battered, and it would have been embarrassing um, because they'd have just put the ball in the net every couple of minutes, and it would have been. It'd have been horrible. And everyone's fine with it at Villa Park, at Old Trafford, when we go yeah. to Wanfield, when we go to the Etihad. But this is none of them places. This is the GTEC community. Yeah, stadium. I mean, they haven't, the only teams they've beaten at home this season are West Ham and Burnley. It's not, mm, you know. Yeah, I understand that. But again, I think they, they're getting to a point where they're looking at the next level because they've spent a few years sort of around mid table. I think they're looking to push on. And I think they got to Europe, didn't they? Or they were close to getting to Europe. So they they're looking to push on and become one of the. I missed that. Did biggest they? Story. I don't know. I might have made that up. To be fair, I, th I think I've got to mix up with Brighton. Start with BR. I so. Yeah, yeah. Right. I don't know, but yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I, I I would like us to be a little bit more positive, but we've got to be realistic that when we go to anywhere in the Premier League, no nowhere's going to be a walkover where we can just go. Hang on, we'll win this. Um, so we have to be we have to be a bit more conservative. Like at, at Kenilworth Road, we can we can play how we want to play. Because teams aren't going to like how we play. This isn't. It's it's a narrow place. Whereas all the other Premier League pitches are big pitches, even Brentford's. And you have to be. You have to adapt to how the home team's going to play a lot of the time. Um, 
unless by chance they have a bit of an off day and then we can counter and start having a go at them. But you're right, we do have to sort of transition a bit quicker. Like if we're, if we're containing, containing and then somehow win the ball, the counter's got to be quick. Yeah, there you're wasn't. Right. You're right there. In that first half, there wasn't a counter attack at all. There was just no threat whatsoever. And then disaster struck at half time, James. It was pretty obvious straight away that Tom Lockyer wasn't coming out for the second half. And so it proved Jacob Brown came on to replace him. We'll talk in detail about that substitution shortly. But if ever you needed a reminder as to why Tom Lockyer is one of the most important and influential players on this football pitch, you only have to watch the next 10 minutes of the game because we were defensively an absolute mess. We were all over the place. We couldn't kick the ball out of the penalty box. Nobody knew who was going where here, there and everywhere. There was no organisation whatsoever. And that is no disrespect to the three that were playing centre-back at the time, Bell, Osho and Mengi. I mean, what's the oldest one there? 26, something like that. Not a great deal of experience. But you could tell we were missing Lockyer. We were 2-0 down in the blink of an eye. The game's gone pretty much by that by that point. And he's just he was just a huge, huge loss. Well, that's the leadership of Lockyer, isn't it? That's what he does. If anyone was questioning about whether he's Premier League he's good enough to be Premier League, I think he's shown in the performances of late that he, he has been, but he's got the added dimension that he'll be in all the players' ears and with his experience be able to guide them through certain elements of it. And that... Those two goals, defensively, Luton haven't looked like they've been doing that for a month or more. That sort of goes back to what was happening at the early stage of the season when they were just trying to figure things out. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's always going to be massive losing your captain. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so, so it proved. It's, um, it's just hopefully it's a precautionary one for that game and, and, and not too much because... Um, yeah, there's going to be some uh, tense times if he's not going to be in the side. Yeah, off with the back injury. Tom Lockyer went after a bit of an assault by Neil Mope in the first five minutes, which until he scored his goal was the only target he ever looked like hitting, to be fair. Um, had, to, had to be him, didn't it? When it sort did. of highlighted him, it mm, did. he hasn't got that many goals. One goal in 14 a, months. But, I mean, he couldn't miss, difficult. could he? The way the ricochet fell to him, it was just... I mean, what Chong was doing in the lead up to that move as well, I mean... No one touches you. It's a freezing cold day. That pitch can't exactly be warm. Stay on your feet or at least chase the bloke back once you do lose it. It was just, I mean, no one covered themselves in glory for that opening goal. To, to be fair to him, I mean, he's probably seen umpteen amount of players come to Kenilworth Road and all over the place this season and just fall over and get decisions uh, such as the seem to be the, the rules these days where you can't really touch anyone. So... Um, there's still a long way to go after that, after he's given the ball away for, for the goal to happen. So um, you've, you've just got to defend that bet. Yep, you have. Uh, and if the Lockyer injury wasn't bad enough, Dan, disaster struck again midway through the second half. Um, mm. Wiesa was on the attack. To be fair, it looked like he was going to score. Mengi's come from absolutely nowhere. Brilliant tackle. But unfortunately, he's done his knee in, in doing the tackle. And... Um, he was off as well. Uh, so that's now kabore has gone from left wing back where he started the second half. He's gone into centre half. Bell's also in at centre half alongside Osho. And we've now got sort of, well, we're, we're even more disjointed than we already were. To the credit of the boys, they got back into the game. 2-1, a lovely goal. The only time we got Ross Barkley on the ball, really on the ball, particularly in that second half. Lovely threaded ball to Jacob Brown, who makes no mistake, but then... Just as you think, oh, can we do a Knott's Forest? Mm. No, we can't because a third goal goes in, sucker punch. Not overly sure the keeper covers himself in glory, but he's got more than enough credit in the bank uh, after the last few weeks. Yeah. But it's just another ball in our box that we just can't get rid of. I mean, he's wriggled past, what, three, four challenges? Mm. Someone just boot a sodding thing into touch. Yeah, it was it was like a really awful game of pinball to watch uh, in the lead up to that. And Kaminsky does what he can to get something on it unfortunately it just happens to parry it in the path of an on running Brentford player and again going back to our Brentford play they when they come forward they commit you, you see they commit people in the box they've always got people they've always got options in the box and literally every other part of the 18 yard is covered because they've got so many forward that are ready that wherever the ball goes there's always someone within a yard or two ready to ping it at us so credit to them for that I suppose but we've we've really just got to deal with it hoof it just just get rid of the bloody thing <laughs> because like you say we were 2-1 um, 
with a few minutes to go, you know, we, we, we the uh, momentum's on us. We could have done a forest, but we ended up cocking it up and handed them a, a, another silly goal, and, and they've come away with three points, which which they deserved on on reflection of the whole game. But you know, it would have been nice to upset another Premier League side and grab away, grab another two 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 result away from home. Wasn't to be because we we just let ourselves down a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah, they did deserve it. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I think we made them look a hell of a lot better than what they are. That was our worst performance of the season. That was the, and it wasn't a good time to produce it either. And it was, yes, injuries are a huge part of that and there's no getting away from that. Mm. But, you know, basics can still be done and uh, and they weren't done in that game. Nearly pulled another one back uh, in it just approaching injury time. So Heath Chong heads the ball in the back of the net. He's offside, though, and he shouldn't be offside from that position. He's got the whole of the penalty box. To himself, just stay on side. You know Townsend's going to find you anyway. Um, kind of summed up the game, really, that disallowed goal. Um, we'll try and find some positives. Uh, the, you know, the safe stand-in and the full-time Switch whistle the are pretty much the uh, <laughs> the main positives. But uh, Jacob Brown, two goals in two games. They're like London buses, aren't they? Poor, poor side had to wait a dozen games for uh, his first goal. Second one's come along less than 90 minutes later. Actually, a lovely goal. Ross Barkley at his best. Beautiful ball. Defender thought he could have it. Stupid mistake. You don't get a ball from Barkley's passes unless you're playing in the same shirt as him. <laughs> uh, once he's gone past the defender, nice composure, roll it in the corner and town are back in the game. Yeah, and he took it magnificently well. Um, that's the confidence that a goal brings, isn't it? I mean, he'd, mm. he'd been playing really well anyway until um, the few games previously when he'd been taken out and had to make his impact off the bench. But... Um, yeah, obviously hadn't got the goal and uh, couldn't say he didn't have the chance to die, he did, he, he did. So he, it's, you know, hit the woodwork and had a cut, uh, one hacked off the line here and there. And I spoke to him last week after he scored the, the winner against Palace and he was saying he didn't, he was starting to think it, whether it would come or not. And, um, but it has, and that, that would do in the world of good now. I think with all the attackers now, scoring and they're, they're, they're all on the score sheet that's a that's a bonus as well and I mean if you we are sort of clutching at straws for sort of bright spots on it but the fact that it came in that last 15 minutes again which has been highlighted when loot that's when get looting and getting the majority of their goals I think I don't know about after this week's round of fixtures but certainly last weekend it Luton were top of the tree for for that which is remarkable for um a promoted side to to do I think and Rob Edwards spoke about that in the in the pre-match press conference. So, you know, if, even though they got beaten and it was comfortable, with never really a, any question about it. Getting one of those is a, is another thing that you can sort of say. Well, yes, they didn't play very well, but they they managed to get a goal. That could be good good for for goal difference, like we've previously said. But also, the sort of not giving up towards the end uh, is, is a bonus thing as well. So, um, you know, they lost ultimately, but that's, that's something you can sort of look back on and, and, and highlight. Yeah. Jacob Brown could definitely be proud of his 45 minutes on the pitch. Uh, that's for sure. He's one of the better players in the Luton shirt mm. on the day. Yeah, let's just put a bit of meat onto the bone of what um, Rob said uh in the lead up to the game actually about Jacob because uh, we did send James along to the pre-match press conference and uh, well it's even more relevant what he said now so here it is I love Brownie he's, he's the best guy you know ever hardest worker brilliant attitude I was so pleased for him at the end of the game but for, you know for the goal to mean something as well for it to get the three points because he deserved that um, you should see how, I mean I'm sure you did but he's running his work ethic in that game when he came on as well was brilliant. He did like three people's running. Um, he's just a, yeah, he's a, he's a diamond of a lad. You'll put, you can put him on in any position, much like Chio in a way. You can put him in different positions. You'll give absolutely everything. Uh, uh, his face, you know, when he scored and at the end of the game as well, just, yeah, it was a great moment. Really pleased for him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And not just scoring, um, Dan, but mm. Last week from left wing, this week from right wing back. So he doesn't actually have to be the focal point through the middle to score goals. So that could be handy, particularly in these games where we only play one up front. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think we've we've tried to do that with, you know, when we've got people like Benny playing out wide as well. He's someone who could probably play in a more advanced role up front. Um, 
and it, it gives us a bit of a balance. I mean, you've got Carlton there who, who does a, I call it donkey work because it's a lot of ugly stuff that a centre forward doesn't want to have to do, you know, holding off defenders. And I feel like teams are doubling up on him because when Carlton's on form, he can hurt you. Um, so you need you need something either side of him for him to go at. And when you've got people like Brown and Benny who are becoming effective in what they do, it's certainly a huge advantage for us. And Rob's obviously highlighted that and they've worked on it in training and made made sure that that's one of our biggest points going forward. Yeah, and uh, yeah, fair, mm. play, fair play to Jacob. Mm. However, was it a surprise that he was on the pitch to begin with? Because when Lockyer goes off, I think most people, certainly around me, were expecting Ryan Giles to come onto the pitch. I wasn't. I was expecting Joe Johnson to come onto the pitch because, as Rob alluded to post-match, he sees Ryan Giles purely as a winger. Uh, none of this wing back or defensive nonsense. He sees him purely as a winger, but obviously Chia Wogben has been so good that Ryan Giles had to buy this time. Therefore, it wasn't Giles who came on. It was Jacob Brown, but it's created a little bit of a hoo-ha on social media. Is it fair? Is that fair enough? I mean, hell, if Rob Edwards hasn't got enough credit to make decisions by now within Luton fans, then when is he ever going to have enough credit after the year that, that he's had? But, were you surprised that it was Jacob Brown and then I guess the part of it was it moved Issa Kabore to the left wing back when you had, well, in the eyes of most fans, two left wing backs on the bench. Yeah, I think you could say it'd be confusing for, for the players having to do that. And then obviously, you know, everything I've seen has been questioning about why, why is Ryan Giles even on the bench if you're not going to play him and that, and, um, you know, other than the first three games, I think 33 minutes he's played in, in total. Um, so obviously there's something there where he's not quite as fancy to do, especially as we talked that I don't think Gio is that particularly fit. Um, and if he can't run it defenders, then wouldn't it be Giles to, to come in? I'll be completely honest with you that his name just hasn't come up in any of the press conferences I've been, been at. And I, I haven't even thought about him really because um, well, yeah, firstly, Chio has been so good and, um, doubt it, yeah, we doubt we talked, we talked in previous podcasts about how he's really just grabbed his chance once Giles came out of the side in the early part of the season that, um, he'd never got really back in, but he's, if that's the case, then he's not the direct replacement for Doughty anymore, is he? Because that Doughty plays that, mm. that role. If he is just a winger and he's competing with Chio. That's a tall order if Chio's fit, but then maybe the questions are, well, if he's not fit, then why isn't he playing him? Um, so yeah, it's a it's a good one to to ponder on because you know he's he's cost five million quid as well as the record transfer. He's a sizable amount of the transfer budget. If it's not quite working, then you'd you'd want to know why. So I guess we'll we'll see on that in the coming weeks, but. Uh, you know, I, I I can understand on the defensive side because in the three games that he did play, I don't think he looked very good in a, in a defensive sense. And not that I've studied Middlesbrough last season, but they were a very tack inside and, mm. and he was up there supplying the balls for um, Akpom and the like. So, um, an archer. So maybe he didn't have to do much defending back then. You, you could well imagine that would be the case. So, um but then it's probably it just throws up another question is well why why did you why did you buy him um so it'd be one to look at i think mm. yeah it's an interesting situation dan as i said uh, rob edwards was asked about giles by the three counties interview i think it was um and he basically said straight up he's not a wing back he's a winger and um that's why he didn't come on for tom lockyer but how how do, how do you see it all i mean Defensively, it's pretty clear he's not as strong as mm. other left backs at the club. I mean, if you think Amari Bell started the game at left wing back, I think he's probably the best defender of the three that supposedly um, play there, him, Doughty and Giles. So away from yeah. home, that's fair enough anyway. But that substitution does seem to, I mean, ultimately Giles did come onto the pitch when Mengi went off. And then Kabore, Kabore went from left wing back to, <laughs> to right centre back. And then Giles. Dizzy by the end of it, kept and swapping. Then, and then Giles did play uh, left wing. And to be fair, he kept the ball well. He found players. Um, 
couple of crosses that on another day could have been dangerous. He certainly didn't do anything wrong. And I can understand why Rob thinks he's more of an attacking outlet than a defensive one. Mm. But it, 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 there, it was just mixed signals, really, particularly in light of the fact that Kabore had to shift across in the first place. Yeah, I mean, James is absolutely right what you're saying. And I think um, when he came in, I think we all thought that Giles would be playing in the wing-back role because that's how we played last year. So you've got Amari Bell, who's probably out, out of the three, and I'll, I'll include Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson is young and hasn't played much at all. Um, so you're probably... Put, put, put him out of the equation for now. Um, but you've got Amari Bell, who's probably our best defensive one of the three. And you've got Giles, who's probably our best attacking out of the three. And then you've got Doughty, who's really good at both, which is why I think Doughty's playing more. Um, I think Giles was brought in to sort of push Doughty that little bit more. And Doughty's just grabbed the ball by the horns and took his chance, really, when when presented, because obviously he wasn't favoured to start with. Um, but I, I, it's, it, Giles must be feeling a bit frustrated having come into a club where he felt he was going to play most games. He obviously knew Edwards because uh, he started his career at Telford when Edwards was there with him. Uh, he's brought him through. They'd have known each other from the Wolves days. Um, and it hasn't happened for him yet. But I, I think he's one of those players that you can, all he's got to do is be patient. And when his chance comes, do what doubt he does and just take grab your chance with both hands and and take it. I'm sure there'll be times where we will use him. I think if you know if you're gonna play with a three four three, I mean old Benny and Brown can't run on can't run on and they're empty forever. And, and especially this month, I think he might feature a bit more this month because we've got another six games coming up and he's he's gonna get his chance and it's up to him how he takes it. Because I I, I seriously think he'll he will get a chance and you know there's there's a place for him there. If yeah. he wants it. Yeah, he'll definitely get a chance, of course. Uh, not just six games coming up, but the first game of January is now at a game against the League One opposition. Um, so there's going to be a chance somewhere along the lines. He's just got to look at Alfie Doughty himself in his position, uh, Jacob Brown, players at Eli Adebayo. They're not starting, but when they're coming on, they're influencing the game. And when you get your chance to influence the game, do that. Because Rob has shown that if you influence the game, Tahith Chong being the prime example, you do end up starting the game. So, you know, he, he's just got to bide his time, Ryan Giles. And, uh, the, the key thing is, and Danny just mentioned it there, Giles was at Telford with Edwards. He was mm. at Wolves' younger ages with Edwards. Edwards knows what Ryan Giles is. Forget what he's been and what he's done in the past. Edwards knows what he's about. So he's the best man qualified for the job to say what he is. And if he sees him as a left winger, he sees him as a left winger. And that's um, all there is to it, really. Uh, I think also, Kev, I think we, we're having to, like we highlighted earlier, we're having to do a lot more defending this this year as well. Whereas last year, we could be a bit more expansive because we were so sorted at the back. But Premier League teams come at you from all angles, whereas a lot of the championship, it seemed to be a lot through the middle, I'd say. Um, and obviously, Giles isn't a defender defensive player so that's why he's not because of obviously the <laughs> Premier League just comes at it from all angles so we are defending a lot more and if he's not a defender he's not going to play as much no it's fair enough I wonder if it, it all changes we haven't got the midfield options at the minute mm. when Lokonga comes back and Marv comes back and maybe that changes the formation options and Giles gets a go then yeah that, I, I could see that defensively you still got a uh, but to come back as well, and God knows how long Mengi and, and, and Lockyer will be out for. But once once it's a more of a full strength side, maybe there's more options. They, I mean, there's it's, there's lots of scenarios here. With there, there are, and Edwards isn't a one trick pony with formation. We've seen that he can, he can he can chop and change a couple of times. Even when forced, as he had to twice on Saturday, but he's done it when we haven't had injuries as well, where the, the game's sort of changing direction and he's not well, hang on a minute, let's, let's double up here, let's take less off of here and just ch chuck it about a bit. So, and that's why we've got the squad we have. So. Yeah, ultimately the chance will come. That's inevitable with all the injuries we've got. Uh, it's just down to him to take it. It just won't come uh, left back by the looks of it. And that's fair enough. Um, another talking point, James, that's come out of the game or the last few games, really. 
six of the last seven goals Luton have scored. You alluded to it earlier. We've got a very good record in the last 15 minutes of games. Six of the last seven goals Luton have scored. It's been when Elijah Adebayo has been on the pitch and not Carlton Morris. Is there something in that? Well, there's something in the stats, obviously. It's something you've got to look at, really. But um, it's a very difficult one um, because Luton have... Luton have tried to keep it tight, as tight as they possibly can to stay in the game. And then towards the latter stages, then you bring on players with legs. And obviously Eli is one of those. Um, and he scored a couple of goals off the bench as, as well. Um, and, you know, he will run after people. Uh, and he he obviously looks desperate to like get back into the side. And so that he's, he's doing all the right things. But I'm not... At this stage, I'm not overly convinced that he's doing the same job that Morris does when he's playing that lone role and it's got to got to hold it up. I think as a hold up man, as, as a player that can take the ball, not not necessarily against Brentford. I don't think it probably happened uh, as much as we'd like there. But in general, if you get the ball up to Carlton, he'll, he'll do his damnedest to keep the ball and try and bring other people in. And I think I'm, I'm not sure that that's Eli's game necessarily, but. Um, you know, the, the stats are compelling, but it's the way that the game is played at each stage, I think, because for for 45 to 60 minutes, yeah, if Luton are trying to keep it tight, then I would have Morris there. If it continues to happen, I think there's the, the debate will rage and I'm, you know, I'm happy to have it. Um, it's no shade on Eli whatsoever, you know, I think he's a fantastic striker and he's been a great servant so far. So um, I think it, I think it will just speak to the fact that Luton are going to be in games towards the end of them if they can keep it tight. Mm. Defensively, if, if things go a bit pear-shaped like in Brentford and the game gets away, realistically, if, you, if, if the team goes 2-0 up, it's hard, hard, really hard to get back in this division. But if you can keep it 0-0 or 1-0, and you get to those stages, then Luton have players that can come off the bench. And I think we all feel it as well when the substitutes are made that there can be some damage there. Yeah, I should add that the one goal of them seven that uh, Eli hasn't been on the pitch for, Carlton Morris actually assisted for Ted and Mengi to open the scoring against Crystal Palace last Mm -hmm. week. So it's not like he's not contributing whatsoever um, at all. And obviously, Carlton Morris is still our top scorer, albeit with three goals. He is still our top scorer this season. And he has a couple of more si- assists on top of that as well. In line with that then, Danny, mm-hmm. does that substitution need to be made earlier? Or could that substitution be made earlier? Or or has Edwards got it about right and it's literally just numbers that are coincidental rather than anything sort of significant? <laughs> I mean, it's... It's an interesting question. Uh, I think it very much depends on the flow of the game and how it's going. Like, like when you get to the hour mark, you sort of you start thinking about the rest of the game, how how we can affect it. Because you're you going at half time, you know what's happened in the first half, and you think, right, ten fifteen minutes, let's let's keep with it again and see how we go, and then then look to make the change. Um, sometimes he does it a little bit later than than that and with like 15 to go 10 15 to go sometimes he does it a little bit earlier um but i mean it like you say it really depends on the flow of the game because you're not going to you're not going to keep doing it if it's not working if it's if you get 20 minutes in and what Colton's doing isn't working and you think well hang on we need a bit more probably could do with a bit more pace up front because we we're starting to win the ball get it up the field but then there's no one to run onto it and Eli can do that um so that's when you do it, uh, but then if it, if it's working, then you, you, it's, it's like the old saying: if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You don't you don't necessarily have to do it each time. Um, I know a lot of fans are asking why can't they play together like they did last year, and again, it's another point, isn't it? Because it's a different league altogether. You, not many teams play with two up front. We've we've managed to do it for so long now that we've sort of become accustomed to it, and. I think now that it's one or the other, we're starting to see how different they actually are. Because like James alluded to, Colton's very good at holding it up. I'd say I could be better than Elijah because it's not Elijah's game. Whereas Elijah's got the pace and can run at people and go at people and really have a go. Uh, So 
It, it's, it, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to it. If I'm honest, I'm just... <laughs> Carlton is... Um, we spoke a couple of podcasts about it um, as well, a couple of podcasts ago, about how many aerial duels he wins as well, which is... Um, it should be, might be, you might think it should be the other way around because of how big Eli is, but he's, he's very good in the air, Morris. Yeah, he, he, he does occupy defenders in that way. He's not getting the goals he did. We didn't expect he'd get as many goals as he did last season because if he did, he'd be a superstar. He'd be off in the window. Exactly. <laughs> he'd be an absolute superstar. But he's doing a lot of this work and, you know, he has been a, as, a, as a front two in, in his only season at Luton and it, it worked so well. So it's a new role as well. And there's a case to say that he's like run himself into the ground at the point that he comes off, which is when you should be bringing on the fresh, fresh legs. Um, he's been uh, doubled up on as well, I think. Yeah, yeah because it's a case they know that. the threat. And I think that happened with Elijah last year. I noticed a lot of teams were doubling up on him and he really struggled to get out of that. He didn't score so many last year as he did the year before where he was banging them sort of for fun. So... There's that there's a different dynamic there you've got to look at as well. How how do you how do you get Carlton out of this rut? Because strikers love scoring goals. They need to score, to score goals, and when when the goals dry up, it starts playing on you a little bit. And it, I noticed Carlton getting frustrated in the Palace game because he would he obviously didn't want to play as deep as he has been, and he's not getting so many chances in the box and not putting them away either. So and then getting bought off. And when really he hasn't done anything wrong, but like like you say, James, he probably has run himself into the ground. So uh, it's... I, I wouldn't say he's in a rut necessarily because he's not... He hasn't scored for ages though. It, that's it, that's it, what I'm getting at. It's, yeah, yes. He, it's that is while. true. Yeah, he's yeah. not scored. But he's not in Jacob Brown's situation where he's had chances mm. to miss. He's just not got in those places. And, and yeah. maybe that's something he's not that been needs asked to, to be... I think. I think it's probably the way why we're playing because he's having yeah. to play so deep because we're having to be so defensive that you know he's not he's not quick enough to like when we get on the counter to get straight in there he can, he can be part of the build up obviously and then if if we manage to get a chance by slowing it down and then bringing it in waiting for him to get in there then there's a chance but like I say he hasn't been getting them mm. and that would that would frustrate you when you've gone from scoring 20 goals in a season to get only getting a couple of penalties and then the odd one here and there, it's going to play on you a little bit because you mm. you want goals and then you've been bought off when you've done you've done what you've, what's been asked of you, um, but you're not getting a goal. It's it's just something frustrating. I, something I noticed in pa the Palace game in particular, maybe because I was more in line with him in in the um, in the second half, was he was he was out wide a lot, mm. and we had this conundrum with James Collins. Remember a while ago, obviously different league. It's almost a different sport, isn't it? But <laughs> Um, he was spending a lot too much time out there where he's, he should just be focused on the six yard area and in that channel, that's where he's going to get his, his, his chances. And um, I think if I remember rightly, he was almost ordered to do that after a certain while, because he was trying to do too much. And I'm not saying that Carlton is trying to do too much. He's probably been told to play in those positions that he is, but when you are doing that and you're out wide, in a crossing position when somebody should be out there and you should be looking to make the run in the middle, then you are going to get less chances. So, yeah. um, but that's almost a symptom of having to play the one up front. I know sometimes it's a three with the attackers, but that's really designed. So the too many, the side can get back and reinforce with, with without the ball. Mm. So um, it is essentially one. And particularly if the game is stretched and uh, Luton are deep, then the, the the size of the space between him and the midfield is always going to be an issue, particularly if your goal is to counter attack because you, you'd you want him, you'd want to get the ball up to him quickly and him to lay it off. But if the midfielder are 40, 40 yards away from him, that's not a counter that anyone's going to be scared of. Uh, and you, and all, all you're banking on there is trying to win a free kick and we don't win free kicks because, <laughs> well... <laughs> Oh, yeah, we didn't on um, Saturday, that's for sure. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I think the thing that Morris does for the team is reflected in the fact that when Lockyer went off, he was given the captain's armband. He was the second of the three captains used on the day. Amari Bell uh, replaced uh, Morris as captain at the end of it. So he's obviously the vice captain of this side. So 
clearly looked upon as a key player. And um, yeah, I've no problem with that. Sometimes numbers just jump out, but there's no actual basis behind them. And um, maybe that's one of them. We will see going forward. Hopefully Carlton readdresses the balance uh, in the week to come or weeks to come rather. Uh, before we finish this podcast, there's one other thing that's happened this weekend, and that was the third round draw for the FA Cup. Bolton at home. I think the first thing, first tick box is a home draw. Everyone wants home draw, even though both home draws last season ended up in away replays, second of which was obviously a bad night at the office at Don't Grimsby. Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that means a return for Cameron Jerome. Mm. He'll come back for the first time since he left, and they're flying, to be fair to them. Top and of the League nice One. As well. Um good game should be a decent draw chance for who knows the people that we've spoken about in this podcast to uh, show why they deserve to be in the first 11 yeah and I, doubt, I don't doubt they'll get get that chance as well it's just where they are where the two teams are in the league now um it's a complete switcheroo from previous fa cup campaigns where you, you've gone to norwich and newcastle and been the underdog now the 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 banana skin is is set there for Luton, isn't it? Really, you're almost damned if you do, damned if you don't. You mm. you've got to beat them. Um, but if you don't beat them convincingly, people start to worry. I, I, I don't think they should, but they, they will. Mm. Um, and if you don't beat them, obviously, then there's questions to answer. But also, maybe a bit of realism it, that that's not going to be the focus. Although ev everybody wants to be on a a decent uh, FA Cup run because. You know, if if results are few and far between, then that could breed confidence. If you if you uh, get in wins, obviously, I think any win does. So, um, yeah, it's the sort of draw you want uh, a League One against a Premier League side. Maybe a League One mid table or struggling side would be a bit better because obviously their confidence will be high. Um, but I'm just <clears throat> just absolutely glad it's at home. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Particularly given that the following game is at Burnley, uh, if they ever choose which night that's going to be played. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> I would like to know because I need to book the holiday for that. Absolutely, will do. Yeah. Um, obviously, <laughs> there's probably less chance of Luton being involved in a replay uh, than maybe there is Burnley being involved in a replay against Tottenham. So we're probably still not any the wiser when that Burnley game is going to take place. You, you're right. You mentioned Carlos Mendes Gomez. Mm. I couldn't off the top of my head remember if he was loaned to Bolton or sold to no, Bolton, but I think sold he sold him. him. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, if he was loaned, he'd be ineligible for the game. So he'll mm. come back. Hopefully, yeah. the, there's none of that Newport strike shenanigans. And, um, yeah, he can pack that in straight he away. He can definitely pack <laughs> that in. Um, but there's only two Premier League games in, Fe in February, in January. Mm. Burnley away, Brighton at home. Brighton's right at the end of the month. So there's no real reason why they can't target this third round game. I mean, often you, when you see players rested, it's because there's a large workload. Well, there isn't in January. There's no excuse there. So uh, maybe we'll go stronger than what we did say at Exeter in the League Cup earlier in the season. Maybe, yeah. And like, as, as I say, I mean, in, in years gone, but in recent years, certainly with a lot of teams now, they tend to use a second 11, but which I'm fine with as long as those whoever plays plays like their life depends on it because it's all very well saying we've got a league one side at home, but don't, don't underestimate teams like that, especially like we did it with Grimsby last year and they would bottom end of league two and they, <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about that, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and Bolton are flying in league one. So, you know, there's, there's, there's that as well, but like you say, there's, there's a chance to get some momentum for players who haven't been playing to get some game time and to try and earn a side, earn a place in the side. And it makes for, it makes for an interesting conundrum for Edwards, what he's going to do with that. Um, I'm sure he's got an, a, an 11 in his mind for that, depending on who's fit, because between now and then there's six or seven games against some very tiny teams that we don't know a lot about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other thing, and, isn't it? There's seven games. You know, it's so. it's going to be a big hangover from that as well, because don't forget, you got you got a game on 26th. Is it the 30th? Is it the 28th and the 30th, is it? Newcastle. 20, yeah. 26th and 30th, mm -hmm. isn't it? 30th this um, Saturday. Yeah, so you got 23rd, 26th and the 30th. And, I mean, that's Newcastle at home, Sheffield United away, Chelsea at home. All big games all big games and uh, not to be sniffed at. And I think from the hangover of those games, I think there's a chance to sort of get a run started, if you like. 
before we then go into the January and then February games. And yeah, it'd be really interesting how he, how he approaches that one. Well, that's often the reason why they put weekend sides out because they need to get game time into players. But with seven games in such a condensed space of time, you would imagine the bench players are going to get enough game time during those seven games that maybe they don't need the game time ergo weaker. I'm not saying full strength 11 against Bolton, but certainly a stronger 11 than what you would normally perceive to be the case in the first round of a cup or first round for us in the cup. Absolutely. You've got to think that injured players might be coming back around about that time as well. Um, I'm thinking maybe Burke and Mads Anderson, but must have had a setback because before the international break, he was being talked of as being sort of near enough ready for when the football resumed. And now he's sort of level pegging with Mads Anderson. So mm. um, it was just you know, so disappointing for him because every time he gets an injury, it's a long one. But um, so yeah, it could be beneficial for those sorts of players as well um, when they're, when they're coming back. So um, and I, 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 I think Luton's, the difference between this season and last season is that Luton's supposed second string are a lot stronger. Um, when we, they have to be when we're talking about um, the strength of the bench in Premier League games and and stuff like that. So um, they didn't look at Exeter, Ted and Mengia side. <laughs> yes, uh, that is true, and we can forget about that one as well. <laughs> but so let's um, stop underestimating people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think the main thing is to. Um, the main thing is to treat the game with the utmost respect, really, yeah. because an effort is key to no strolling about. I think it's, it is key for building confidence, building a continuing a bit of cohesion. And, you know, everybody's looking for Luton to slip up in the Premier League. And it'd be even worse if they get bit, beaten by a team two divisions below. Um, that's not good for confidence whatsoever. No, hopefully we can build some up, but that's uh, a month away now, but we will preview that as and when it comes along. That's it for this episode of the podcast. Not the most um, positive podcast we're going to produce this season, but hey, you really can't polish a, you know what, so to speak. And that's pretty <laughs> can't much... can cover it glitter though, and we didn't really do that. No, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty much... Um, all we had to offer really. So uh, my thanks to James and to Dan for joining me for this podcast, to you for watching or listening, however you've consumed this podcast. Christmas is approaching just over three weeks away. If you're looking for a present to give someone, how about a trust membership? £10 for the season, as we've said in many podcasts, and we will certainly be highlighting it in a podcast towards the end of this week. Uh, the more members we can have, the stronger our voice and the more that we can deliver for Luton Town fans in light of what's going on uh, around the football world. Just £10 to join for the whole year, £5 for concessions. So if you're looking for a sort of random Christmas present, how about hitting the Trust website and signing up? Uh, if you're already signed up, sign a friend up. The more the merrier. We're um, open to everyone. Thanks to everyone um, for listening. As I say, thanks to the High Town Club for hosting the podcast. Once again, if you've heard a little bit of music, I'm sure you know the drill by now. They do have entertainment on when we record. Uh, we do try and dampen it out and we hope it hasn't ruined your listening experience. Thanks to Sean Grant and the Wolfgang for the intro music and to Ed Smith Creative for all the designs that you see on the set. Until next time, and that's going to come very, very fast with the, all the games that are coming this week. And in line with that, if you subscribe wherever you receive this podcast, you'll hear exactly when all of the podcasts in December drop. Till next time, come on, you hatters. You know what I love about this town is actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're Luton people, and that's what we care about.